I'd like to introduce Davy Kianum. Um, she works at Target and has 13 plus years of experience in analytics and BI space. She has an MS in genetic, genetics and statistics, MS in software engineering, and an MBA with specialization on data sciences. She's a guest speaker for the schools of graduate and professional programs at St. Mary's University in, of Minnesota and also an ad, advisory board member of two startups in the Twin Cities. So today's um, event, and hopefully you're all in the right room, is data science for a social cause, price forecasting with ARIMA and hybrid assembly models to help farmers in rural India. So Devi. I'm Devi Kyanam, and I'm very happy and delighted to share my story about the work that I have been a part of. I work for Target, but this is a pro bono effort uh, that I'm going to talk about today for the past five years that I have been actively engaged with. Today's topic is about price forecasting models using ARIMA and hybrid ensemble techniques. But I would also like to know a little bit about what you guys are looking forward to, and I would like to get a little gauge of the audience. So I'm hoping to cover the background, the purpose, hypothesis, and a more traditional problem-solving research problem methodology, but I would also like to know what your interests are. So with that, I would like to know how many of you here are statisticians, model builders, okay? Uh, how many of you have exposure to agriculture in, in India or in the US? All right. So with that, I would like to know how many of you in, are interested to know more about modeling and the technical statistical aspects? All right. And of course, the rest are interested in how it's implemented and how the whole process went through the rural India. I would cover that as well. All right. So I would like to give you a little background of what agriculture looks like in India, which is very different from the US. And for us, especially, especially people working in corporate America, it's more than 60% of the Indian population depends on agriculture. And unbelievably, only 16 to 20% of the GDP is contributed through agriculture. So with that, you can say there are a lot of people depending, but not necessarily contributing equally enough for the GDP for the country. Most of the farmers are super poor. I would say they may be having half an acre of land to maybe two acres. That is the targeted audience that we are trying to help. These people mainly do agriculture for subsistence. They grow their own food and it's not necessarily to uplift their level of living, and it's basically to eliminate poverty and to help them have food for the, all through the year. So there are a lot of research that happened to produce hybrid varieties that would evolve, produce a lot more yield every year, and in spite of all that efforts, the poverty level and the lifestyle is not changing for these lower income farmers. And again, this is because of various reasons. The, the circumstances and their knowledge. Typically they are in rural places and many a times there are local vendors who would come to them, buy their produce right near the farms and whatever is given to them is just taken. There is, no, there is no knowledge about what the prevailing prices are and how they would be maybe in two to three months from then. So they are forced to take the price that was offered to them, sell their produce, and that's how they make their living. So um, an initiative was started by World Bank around 2011, 2012 timeframe. It's called National Agricultural Innovation Project 
And the main goal is to educate these farmers to make wise choices on holding their produce or selling their produce at the right time so that it will alleviate the poverty. And this was done in collaboration with multiple agricultural universities across the country. And there are also communication channels and there are media that they use to help educate the farmers. That was the framework, that's all it started off with. And the goal is to definitely make a sustainable improvement in their lifestyle. So a lot of people volunteered in this process in addition to the scientists at the agricultural universities and the funding that has been provided by the World Bank. Many people in the universities with PhDs, books, docs, both in India and also some people in the US came forward to help build the models or figure out a way to help all these poor farmers. So this is more taken up in a technical or more uh, experimental design perspective, like a research project, on what are we trying to solve? So it's basically to say, maybe if we can accurately forecast the prices, we can guide the farmers and help them make wise choices and maybe manage the price risk even better. So that is the whole purpose of this problem that we are trying to solve. And in this world of uncertainty, having some indicators or a crystal ball is very, very helpful. So the hypothesis of the problem that we try to address is that it's not all random. Price, pricing is not just something that happens without any pointers or without any background. So the hypothesis is that by using the past values of the prices for the crops, we can accurately predict the future prices. And it's not just random. So we all know, where do we start? Data, right? So we use the secondary data that is captured and stored in Indian government websites. They are called um, AG, MarkNet, uh, Krishi, Maratha, Vahini, and some of those. I was more closely associated with the work that is being done in South Indian um, universities of agriculture. So these are the places um, that I have potentially um, been a part of or using as a source of the secondary data. And luckily enough, we had large history of data maintained as well from 2000 um, onwards for some of the crops and it started increasing for other crops uh, as years progressed. So median, median prices and model prices were stored uh, in these websites and that data is used for the model building. Again, we used the monthly and weekly model prices for analysis and for uh, forecasting. And we have used at least 10 years of data for training and testing your um, model that is built and used one to two years for validation. And then once we feel that the model is stable, um, we used it for forecasting. So that is the primary breakup of how this data is used. And the unit of measure for most of these agricultural commodities in India is quintal, which is like 100 kg, and the currency is Indian rupees. So as I talk about this, um, these are the units I would be referring to. So we, as I told you, like it's a huge um, agriculturally focused country, and where do we start? So we had a high level methodology or a strategy defined where we thought we should be categorizing different agricultural commodities into groups. It could be like major grain crops like rice, wheat, and some of those grains, vegetable crops, tomato and other vegetables, fruit crops, spice crops, and also oil yielding crops. They have different patterns and different seasonality and different trends associated with different kinds of crops. So that's how these, we broke them into the major groups. And then we thought, okay, let's start with one crop per category in each of these groups 
and let's use at least two, four markets for each crop. And for folks who don't know what and how the markets are in India, like a few of those villages will have a one market closely in the sense proximity to their village. So people bring their produce there and sell it. So those are, those are markets, and they are very local. It's not like you see in a website, this is a standard price, and everybody knows how to sell it and how to take it and, and take the advantage of the pricing. We are not talking about every minute price forecasting. We are not talking about real-time price forecasting. We have to understand that there is in that kind of a mechanism to even help these farmers understand what is happening in the next two months. They are used to selling this produce as soon as it is all done and harvested. So we are giving them a guideline to say, hey, this is the best time to sell it. Maybe you can save it for two months and sell it. Maybe you will get a few more rupees than what you would get by immediately selling it. So it's more of a guideline. We are not talking about real-time analytics, and we are not talking about minute-to-minute -minute time forecasting, like stock markets or indexes. This is the framework I think you guys can now understand what we are talking about. So with that, um, we also needed to understand what is the optimal forecast intervals. Should we do di daily forecasts? Should we do monthly forecasts? Or do we need to have weekly forecasts? because not all crops are looking the same. So for crops like rice, it's more monthly that made more sense because the fluctuation is not that rapid. But when we talk about vegetables and perishables, which was very daily related uh, trends that we have seen, the reason is there isn't much refrigeration. We don't have people storing this in, in immediately near the fields and marketing it to distant places. So there is a point of perishability associated with it. And everybody is, is harvesting tomatoes that day, the price is going to go down. So that is the situation. So daily forecast made more sense for those kind of crops. So get, coming back to the technicalities, and I'll also talk a little bit on how this results of this research or building the model and how they were all translated back to the farmers. I will cover that in the end, but for the lot of interest on how this forecasting is done, I am going to jump into a little bit more technical aspects. So typically forecasting is based on using the past observations to develop a model. And then once we feel the model is good, we apply it for future values. There are different ways to do this, and there are linear methods and also non-linear methods. So linear traditional approaches are like autoregressive, moving average, um, exponential smoothing, and some of those are some of the examples. When we also go to non-linear, um, we have more machine learning, neural networks, all other components that come into play. So we started the journey with simple things, and we have developed um, and grown the model to be much more sustainable. So we started off with using the ARIMA model, which is very traditional, Box Jenkins method. Uh, it's the PDQ method, a model with, and again, I just want to repeat what ARIMA is for folks who don't know, autoregressive integrated moving average model. And here there are three terms that we should be paying attention to. There's PDQ. So typically, it is the autoregressive part is as P. D is the number of, is the amount of differencing that we need to do with the data. And for some of the statisticians, it may make more sense. For others, take it as this is about more of a data processing that we need to do before forecasting. And also, like how do we use these components in the model? And Q indicates the smoothing component or the moving average part. So in this equation, we are talking about the current observation and how it is dependent on past observations and also the associated error component. And again, when we are talking about autoregression, this is for people who are not mathematicians or statisticians. The next value in a time series um, can be predicted as a function of its past observations. That's what we mean by autoregression. 
So the question is, like, how many past observations do we really need to consider? And that is the number of lagged values. So these are com some of the components that we need to do as an exploratory part before actually validating the model or doing the forecast. And some of the tests that can be used eloquently in this process are autocorrelation, ACF and PACF, which are used mostly as abbreviations. And these will help us to understand if the data is stationary or not and how many lagged values we should be considering and putting in the PDQ of, of the ARIMA model. So the ARIMA methodology, we can actually break it down as identification of the model, estimation of the model, diagnostic check and validation, and then we do the forecast. I will explain this a little, but before that, we need to do the data preparation, getting all the data from the website, scraping it, cleaning it, finding the weekly or the monthly model prices, and then just to observe the data, how it is looking. Is there any trend? Is it stationary or not? So, and one of the requirements, or which is doesn't, like ARIMA is not strict about, but it should also, we should also know that to get good results, we need stationary data, and I would explain what it really means uh, in a second. So when you look at the graph here, you see there's a clear trend. Like, it's just going one after the other, and it's going upwards. So let's see if it's all real or it's, it is stationary. Is there a trend, is seasonality, or is the data piling up on each other? So this is what the stationary series looks like, where we are making it pretty random. Each observation is not quite dependent or taking a trend from its previous observations. And that can be achieved through differencing. That means the observation minus the second observation could give you the difference to value. And you build the model off of that, not the raw values that you are using in the, from the web. And this is just a test, as I told you, the ACF plot. Um, just before differencing, you can see how the data is mapped onto this plot. But after differencing, see how it has changed. And this is when we will know how many lagged values or past observations we should be considering. And in this case, it will be one, with the confidence intervals. Similarly, PACF plot shows the partial component without the error into consideration. And then we need to estimate the model. Like, what are the different combinations of PDQ we can put in the model and see how it is doing? So basically, we are studying the efficiencies of different combinations of PDQ. And the, it can be validated using multiple um, tests and errors, residues calculations like MAPE, mean absolute percent error of residues, RMSE, and also mean absolute error. And different models were used, and this is an example of where you can see where the error component um, is much lower, and that's where we start off. And using the best fit medium ARIMA model, here you can see the example um, in different markets, different ARIMA models came, came to show different um, combinations, giving much more accurate values and results for forecasts. And then we need to validate the model for adequacy, and we do the test for randomness, test for normality, um, and statisticians here would know why we should do that. And once we feel good about a model, we will use it for our validation, the next two years of data, which were not a part of the training data set. And then evaluate the MAPE and see how they are looking, how it's looking. If it is looking all right, go for it for forecast. If not, go back and reiterate, iterate the model and see how it would progress. And again, we will also save the upper and the lower confidence intervals for the forecast, and we don't go by raw numbers. 
And again, we are sharing with people who are illiterate and may not have a lot of um, knowledge on what all this information actually means. So, so when we did it with ARIMA, this is just an example, like 7.8% MIP, uh, which is not too bad, more than 90% accuracy, which is helping them. And we are saying that, hey, in the next, this is again, the, pardon me, the labels are not very clear. Um, but it's basically saying if you sell the produce now, you may be getting around 3,900, um, but if you may wait for a little longer, you may be getting past 4,000. And that really helps to make them a choice to say, is it worth saving all the produce in a storage and pay for it? Or should we just sell it, be done with it, and take whatever comes in? So it's not a huge variation. Again, we are talking about rupees here, so it's very different on how they perceive those numbers versus how we perceive here in America. So as you see, this process was pretty cumbersome. We are talking about all the crops um, and in different markets and a lot of manual work involved and Arima is both art and a science. We, we, we spent a lot of time to get these levels of accuracy. So we need a little bit more, um, I would say, a, a, a methodology which is not so volatile, which we can rely on, maybe a little bit more well-programmed approach um, to work through different components of these agricultural commodities. So there was a huge need we felt that, you know, it's, it's more becoming an, an art and a cumbersome way. So maybe we should start looking at what other things are coming and being developed in the marketplace and in the research industry. So we came across um, a research paper that was done or published by a PhD um, person, I think it's Peter Zhang, um, on hybrid models using ARIMA and also artificial neural networks. That seemed pretty fascinating and we started digging in a little further. So the best part of that hybrid model which that person um, have learned is ARIMA does a great job um, in, the in predicting the linear components. And artificial networks here have done an awesome job figuring out the error component which together would give you the forecast. And it also has an added advantage where the artificial networks, when they are doing the overfitting of the model, ARIMA comes into play and fits it really well. We are not tailoring it too much towards ARIMA or towards artificial networks, which is the black box. And it does a great job, but sometimes it can be overfitting the model. And that's the reason why um, this was looked into, and that seemed to show amazing results. Um, so we thought we should be using something in addition to ARIMA for making better forecasting. So we used, started applying the exponential smoothing, state space models, ETS, um, where it does a little bit of more intelligent way of weightage. It gives more weightage to most recent values and less to the past values. In ARIMA, we, we put them all together. We look at all it bit as one bucket. But here, it gives a little different weightage to the most recent trends than the past observations. And luckily, um, hein, Hindman or Heinemann, I don't know how to say the last name, but we found that he came up with a hybrid forecast R package, which was awesome. So where it's all done, and you really need to use it and not have to think a whole lot of every step of um, what is happening behind the scenes. So that is, that is was really a big boon to, and it started off in 2016, which is fairly new. We started off with our traditional approaches and it's a journey. So using that R package um, was a lot easier and we were able to try many combinations. Um, and again, it's all trial and error. So basically, you could run different models, ETS and ARIMA, and see how it is looking like. And we can also specify the amount of weightage 
we want to give between models. Say, for example, in hybrid package, I want to use ETS, ARIMA, and TBATS. I can say, give equal weights to all of them, give me the forecast. Or I can say, okay, ARIMA seems to be doing really well, let's give it more weightage than other models. So that's where we have some more levers in place to manage the forecast. This is just an example um, on where there's a real data, the forecast done with using ARIMA and also with ETS. Uh, here we can see that ARIMA has done a good job of predicting very close to what the actual data is, and you see the green in the bottom where the ETS is not quite. So with that, we can adjust. Uh, that's the whole point of using the hybrid R package. It, and it really worked. Um, in a, one of the examples that I have tried, um, the MAP came down exponentially, and I would say it's substantially to 3.2%. Um, and we don't have to go with like extremely accurate answers here. Again, the nerdy side is happy by seeing very accurate answers, but does it really help the ultimate problem solving? Not quite. So, but is it helping us to play a little better with forecasting? Yes. So those are the things we have like now more levers to play with and not to go more on the artsy side of um, ARIMA modeling. So with that, we could clearly conclude that definitely um, the pr prices are not random walk and we could do a good job in predicting the future values. And the hybrid model is much a lot easier to try and it outperformed the traditional model. Uh, it, low, it has a lower generalization variance of error. It reduced the model uncertainty. It seemed to be a lot better, and of course, we measure in terms of the error component, which came down significantly. So now coming back, um, like how are we going to tell this story to our farmers in India who are illiterate, don't know anything about this, and how do we build trust that this actually works? We have challenges in everyday life on how do we convince or build the trust with our business to say that this is right, please follow it. And they say, we have years of experience, we don't trust it. We all have seen this happen. Now we are talking about that, not that level of corporate leaders, we are talking about illiterate farmers. How do we help them build that trust and make those forecasts that are available for them to? El to come out of their poverty and have a little better quality of life. So the communication and the mechanism for dispersion of information becomes super critical. Um, again, this is something which I can't do being here in the US. I could only contribute to the model building and some strategic way of breaking the problem. So there's a lot of work that was done at the universities of agriculture sciences. Government of India supported them a lot. A lot of NGOs were very, very critically involved. And the success comes with adoption. And that is done in phases. So you can't just say, hey, these are the prices we are predicting and do what you want to do. And there nobody's going to believe it. And nobody's going to listen to it. So that's where coaching and relationships within the villages became really important. And the NGOs were very, very uh, important players in this whole process. So some villages were taken as focus groups, and these people worked with, the NGOs worked with them very closely, and there are also voluntary social workers who took these forecasts, and not the exact numbers, they just took the ranges, or upper and lower confidence limits, and also using some local wisdom. It's not just numbers. So how are the other local conditions prevailing? What other things are they reading? Um, and they combine the message into a more subtle trend information. So they are not saying, hey, tomorrow it's going to be 4,500, go ahead and sell it, because after three months it's going to be 4,200. No, that's not going to work. And 
and nobody is going to believe it. And if somebody believes it and it doesn't actually match the numbers, they are in trouble. So they don't want to do that. So it's basically a trend giver to say that you will make a little more if you do this. So with that, a lot of folks started trying it in simple ways. And again, not selling entire produce at once, maybe listening to maybe getting convinced to say half of it we will sell it now. Maybe let's see what the forecast is and actually try it. And once they started feeling confident, then the adoption became a lot more easier. There are few people who want to try and not many people will come forward. And those are the people who will lead the others in the village to make them follow. So that's how step by step it was slowly um, um, adopted in the villages. And then they have gone big, not just these model villages, but they started giving announcements in radios and television. And also even these poor farmers have cell phones these days. So messaging some of those like, hey, this is an insight. What do you want to do? Or you know, say, do this. Um, maybe it's not worth storing for six months and paying the storage costs, sell it. So some of those indicators were started coming back to the people. And uh, it is pretty impressive to see how it all got adopted. It's not, it's again, it's very cool to say that, hey, we got so much a percentage of accuracy. We used all these sophisticated models. These people don't know what is all be done behind the scenes, but they got a little insight that would help them make a decision on what they should be doing for the future. All right. Thank you, everybody, for having me, and have a nice evening.